Thank you so much uh, for coming. I am extremely honored to represent our team here. Uh, we have a we have a large team uh, that spans six continents, uh, looking at the challenge of building materials in the climate. I'm uh, represented here today with uh, my colleagues who are co-leading the study. Dr. Meiling Loko from Ghana is leading the West African uh, spotlight. Dr. Mohamed Ali Atman, who will be joining our panel today, uh, is leading the, is co-leading the India study. And Dr. Mo, uh, Naomi Kina is leading the North and, and South America uh, circular material economy study. So we're a large group of architects, engineers, scientists, and industry professionals who are looking at how we can really rethink building materials and the climate based on a wealth of practices that we've accumulated over thousands of years. Um, and it's true that our approach and our report will focus a lot on the science. But I think it's really important also to say that building materials are not just about em so-called embodied energy, that is all of the energy that we um, expend uh, to extract, produce, transport, and implement build building materials on site, or about the operational um, energy or carbon, if you will, um, if it's a fossil-based uh, energy that is used to drive building systems for heating, cooling, lighting, and, and other plug loads. But it's also about the impact that our material use has on regional ecosystems and on urban heat island effects and other ancillary costs of materials, the way that we metabolize materials um, globally and locally has extended impacts uh, on global health of living systems, including and especially human systems. So we are going to be looking at this from the standpoint of a whole building life cycle. But first, let's look at how and where we're using materials today. Today, as we can see from this chart, the preponderance of our building materials are coming from extracted mineral-based materials, concrete, steel, brick, and aluminum. And they constitute the vast majority of the carbon footprint of the building, the global building um, sector as a whole. However, and we can see here in 2015, it's tempting to think that this is how we always have to build and how we always have built. But if we look at this chart from 1945, this is post-World War II, we can see that the preponderance of our global material flows were actually bio-based. We had a small fraction. We managed to build very large global cities with bio-based and earth-based material processes. And how did we do that? Over the, across the world, the preponderance of the materials, as our illustrious panel from this morning pointed out, came from local sources of earth and bio-based materials. And we can see that they were very much adapted to local bioclimates. We can see here we have a, a, a hybrid, hot, humid, hot, arid climate on the right. And on the left, we have a, a hot, humid climate. We can see they're not the same shapes, they're not the same forms, and they're not the same materials. Um, here we can see on the right-hand side how materials were formed in order to actually respond, even within one day, a change in wind uh, uh, patterns and slight changes in humidity. Tremendous knowledge, embodied knowledge, let's say, that we had for centuries that we have largely forgotten about in uh, the 20th century in our so-called advanced systems, our scientific or advanced engineering systems. And we're not advocating necessarily a back to the future. We're not saying, let's go back to the way we built 100 years ago, because we know that the, with the global population and market pressures, we need advanced materials and we need scientific-based advanced processes. However, we must combine with going back to the fact that we need to tailor our materials if we're going to get to so-called on-site net zero energy, or let's say net zero energy in water, because we always have to look at the energy water nexus in our material production, extraction, and maintenance. 
then we really do need to start to look at a tailored on-site local solution to our buildings. And we do need to start to shift back towards bio-based and biocompatible processes as much as we can, while maintaining the health of regional and global ecosystems and forests and agricultural lands. So just looking at what we do with energy and let's say the carbon footprint, what we're looking at if we are largely a fossil-based energy economy, which unfortunately we still are, but we are going to shift towards renewables, um, we look at the embodied carbon um, of materials and we look at operational carbon emissions. This is really the material carbon emissions will have, as we said, all of the process-based emissions. And then ultimately, it leads towards what we call a carbon use intensity, which we can measure in our buildings over time and over the course of a life cycle. This is a chart to illustrate what Jonathan was talking about, which is that as we start to decarbonize our grid over time, as we get better numbers in terms of the way that we are um, operating, and as we get better practices for operational energy, that is, we're going to decarbonize as much as we can our heating, cooling, lighting, and plug load systems. We can see here that in the light green, the embodied carbon of materials has starts to ha take on greater and greater significance proportionally uh, to the building life cycle over time. This chart shows in the uh, light blue operational carbon with a standard performance building, but in the dark blue, we can see that we are largely starting to decarbonize. Uh, as um, our uh, prior speakers have said, we have some good news on the operational front. Um, but let's take a look at materials. And I apologize, this is a little bit washed out this slide, but we can see if we were gonna go all the way to the top of this chart that primary concrete is the preponderance of the bulk of the building materials that we use. Um, we can see that only a fraction of that um, uh, is uh, recycled, uh, less than 10%. Um, when we look at the metals, uh, like steel and aluminum, of course we know that they can recycle very nicely, but what is the proportion? It's very small steel. Why? Because we have a growing gap between the demand and the supply of recycled aluminum and steel. So we don't have as good a story as people will tell you. We need to do better in our design for disassembly and reassembly of these systems. Uh, now if we start going towards the bottom of the chart, and on the left-hand side you see 2020 where we are today, we have a tiny fraction of materials that we use in the bio cat uh, categories, even timber. Timber, you would think that would be much uh, larger as I showed you from our graph from 1945, it was the preponderance of material flows were bio-based. Today it's very small, um, but we could, if we were to sustainably manage wood, timber, bamboo, agricultural waste, mycelium, and living biomass, they should, by 2060, really rise to be about half of our material sector. Then, the preponderance of our non-renewable sectors need to start to participate in what we would call a circular material economy. That means that we need to try as hard as we can throughout the life cycle to design out the waste, meaning we're gonna design for reuse, reuse of materials, and then if we cannot reuse, we will recycle. Of course, as we can see on this chart, everything um, that is not, uh, we're still going to be uh, using a lot of materials, uh, sorry, a lot of primary base materials um, in 2060. We're still going to be producing. So we have to figure out how to de decarbonize the production and the gestation of materials. Now, how do we do that? We're looking at really exemplifying within the built environment sector exactly what the Secretary General told us at the beginning of this conference, that if we do not cooperate, we will not reach our goals. Nothing could be more true um, uh, about that statement than the built environment sector, where we must look at the production, construction, use, and end of life, or we would say end of use, because we don't want to take them out of their life cycle. Um, and through research, policy, and finance, we must simultaneously incentivize the stakeholders across that life cycle to cooperate and to be equally responsible. We need a level playing field. We have to close the carbon loophole in the built environment sector. We cannot penalize countries that are producing and under tremendous amount of pressure to produce uh, at a very, very low cost. Uh, we must be shouldering the responsibility. We cannot have um, a either um, uh, a taxation for for um, 
reducing costs and reducing environmental regulations, and that also includes human beings in the process. If we're going to have sustainable ecologies, human beings are the living systems within those ecologies, so we must also couple fair labor practices with fair environmental practices and support those countries in order to get fair prices for those practices. So, as Jonathan said, we are looking at a, a framework to look at avoiding, shifting, improving, and adapting the built environment sector for materials. And when we say avoid, we're saying design better with less. We're not saying do without. This is a very, very important uh, distinction. A lot of people, when they hear saying, build less or build with less. We're not actually saying that because I don't think that it's in any way viable or fair to emerging economies to say you should stop building after, we, after many advanced economies have built up. What we're saying is build better, decarbonize, and we can then the global south and emerging economies will show the rest of the world the way and they can leapfrog in many sectors as we'll see in a minute. We, we're gonna shift uh, to the uh, use of alternative materials we have to improve our decarbonization of conventional materials and, of course, adapt to reduce operational carbon in general. One of the most important um, uh, aspects of our report that we're going to focus on is it's very difficult, actually, to transition from a linear to a circular material economy in construction. There's a lot of lip service that gets, that's given to it, but it is not an easy thing, and that's why we need the cooperation. Um, we need to basically look at how energy, water, and primary materials will, instead of being the primary producers in the built environment sector, because it's be by far the largest sector towards emissions, wastewater, and uh, construction waste, we're looking at keeping those secondary materials in the system and also even with on-site uh, zero and district zero, sustainable means keeping energy and water into the system through renewable means. One important thing that I also think we need to focus on here is that the more we build, the more materials we have in the built environment sector. So we have a lot of those materials, especially in the global north and in um, uh, evolved economies that have really a lot of mid 20th century failing structures that they could be recuperating and reusing. We can start thinking about materials, uh, uh, buildings not for demolition and, and landfill, but as material banks. But one very important thing about that is at end of use, um, we need to very much prioritize the re adaptive reuse of buildings themselves. That means our first, um, all of our first choices are on the right-hand side of this graph, meaning that um, we, want to, um, uh, we, we want to reuse our buildings. If we can't reuse our buildings, we will reuse the components. If we cannot reuse the components, then we will reuse the materials. And as a last resort, we will recycle. So recycling is a buzz term, but that would be our last resort in a circular material economy. Why? Because it's very chemically and energetically expensive. So we don't necessarily want to do that. We want to keep things in place if we can. How do we keep things in place? All the way back to the design phase. We have to design for disassembly and reassembly and, and, and reuse as much as possible. So a quick snapshot, and then I'll um, pass the baton to my colleagues. Um, in the different sectors, um, Cement in the concrete sector is by far um, the contributor towards the carbon footprint of the concrete and cement uh, sector. But as we know, concrete is extremely valuable to us. It's, it is durable. Um, it's, it, um, it gives a great amount of structure uh, for the price point, and um, it's not going away. So we need to reinvent cement, and it can be reinvented through a number of different strategies. Um, we have to over, uh, avoid the material overuse by optimizing design. That means digi digitalizing the process as much as possible through computer-aided processes. We'll adapt carbon capture and storage at plant, but also potentially um, re-inserting um, that carbon back into the production of concrete itself in order to increase the strength of, of concrete. And of course, as I said, we want to adapt with as much bio-based content and of secondary materials as possible. Steel is the next largest emitter, uh, carbon emitter in the built environment. And in ste with steel, um, really we need to improve the quality and collection of scrap because steel can be very nicely recycled if we, uh, or reused, components reused. This is a good example, this building we're in right now, um, of lots of recycled aluminum and steel or reused um, that we can design for disassembly and reassembly very quickly in all of our buildings. Um, we need to shift the production to renewable electric energy. That means we need to electrify the process and, and, and use best available technologies. We need to adapt um, the design of materials uh, with the entire 
uh, building life cycle in mind. Um, aluminum is a growing uh, area. Um, we use aluminum, we're increasingly replacing steel with aluminum on building curtain walls and facades. We need to dramatically improve the recycling rate for the initial chart that still shows only a fraction of recycled aluminum because we need to uh, adapt the design of alloys with aluminum alloys with recycling in mind. And we really need to shuff, shift production again to renewable electrical energy sources. All of these materials, concrete, steel, and aluminum, really depend on a clean grid mix. We will not decarbonize without the grid. Um, in fossil-based plastics and polymer composites, this is also a dramatically growing area. We can see it all around us. There's probably not one single surface in this building right now that doesn't have a plastic surface on it, and we can smell it. So um, this is a big issue for health and well-being. Uh, we need to dramatically reduce and shift uh, the off-gassing of emissions in the production of plastics and also in the implementation. Uh, I feel obligated to say that as we sit here. We might have a few headaches in the room by the end of the day. Um, but we also need to adapt towards greater and greater bio-based feedstocks. We're not quite there. We need to collect, uh, improve collection and sorting. But with bio-based plastics, like with all the material sectors, we really need to improve the energy, sorry, the research and development uh, towards the um, uh, circular adoption of aquaculture waste um, from, um, and also agricultural waste towards bioplastics. Uh, so we can partner with uh, the agricultural industries in, 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 in this way. Glass is a very, very important material for the future. It definitely gets a hugely bad rap, um, a deserved bad rap around the world because we've replaced in many areas commercial building stock uh, from sustainable local uh, uh, earthen and biomaterials towards a lot of glass and steel on the facade. So glass has in many areas, especially in those cooling degree climates like the one we're in here in Egypt, it has dramatically uh, driven up the cooling requirements and loads of buildings. However, and this is a big however, glass is very important towards future on-site net zero because it may be the material that we need in order to maximally absorb, capture, so capture, store, and redistribute solar energy for internal building loads. So we need glass, but we need to adapt glass not to reflect energy and waste the energy, but to take it into the system. So. Uh, we need to very much uh, shift the, towards the electrification and shifting to best available technologies, improve incentives for local production and recycling, very important glass. We can re recycle, it's one of the best materials for recycling. But we also need to adapt um, uh, renovation and demolition practices to maintain the quality. It's fragile. Uh, easily uh, curtain wall systems and glass systems can be uh, destroyed um, in that process and we need to both design for demolition in mind so that it can be reused. Um, and finally, oh my goodness, sorry, oh, my. okay, <laughs> finally, we need to ramp back up. It, this is the back to the future moment. We need to go back also to abundant earth materials like masonry and earth-based. We need to adapt standards for earth-based materials. In Africa, we have the, some of the most beautiful um, uh, uh, global heritage uh, uh, architecture that is earth-based. And we must learn from the past to go back to these very sustainable methods where they are biodegradable and they are, can be a great part of the circular material economy. But we need the standards because they're not regular. If the more bio uh, material you have in earthen material, it can be very much dependent on the local um, geology um, and uh, earth conditions. So standards are critical, um, but we can improve um, in, in so many different ways. We also need to shift so social material acceptance. Sadly, uh, there is a premium on so-called modern buildings uh, the, around the globe to show that we're modern. And so a lot of times um, in um, regional um, uh, economies that have an, a wonderful tradition of earthen-based materials, it gets rejected because it's not the image that a lot of um, companies maybe or, or um, uh, buildings want to project. So that is a challenge that we have. It's also a challenge with timber and wood. Um, we need to shift the social acceptance towards um, understanding that this is a material that can last a very long time. Actually, where we're from at Yale, the preponderance of the building stock is in wood, and it's lasted for four or five centuries. We have many old houses that are already more than 400 years old, but they're maintained over time, so they stay in place. Uh, we have to improve the material recovery of timber base, and we very much, per what we're smelling today again, we need to avoid petrochemical-based blues, chemicals, and coatings that are terrible for health and well-being, terrible for the ecosystem, and also reduce um, 
the circularity of these systems, our ability to recycle them um, into new uh, uh, material economies. Um, this is just a quick uh, summary uh, uh, snapshot. Um, if you see the business as usual, <laughs> um, if we, even if we adopted all of our best practices and all of our, um, uh, you know, the things that are happening right now with the decarbonization of materials, we will still dr substantially increase in the carbon emissions by 2060 um, if we're business as usual. So if we adopt all of the different um, whole building life cycle from production to, to uh, dis um, design, distribution, and implementation and end of life, we can dramatically decarbonize all of these sectors. But we must shift over towards the bio-based. And I know that I'm out of time, so, but oh, I didn't want to. And la lastly, I just want to emphasize that we need to also go back to uh, designing through ma nature-based processes. We need to start thinking about biomass materials as a material. That means living systems are materials that we will um, uh, uh, design our cities with and we will cover surfaces with. Um, and we will be part, once again, of the kind of bio-based pathway uh, as opposed to the mineral-based pathway, which as we see is only part of our recent history. Only the last hundred years did we start really ramping up on mineral-based processes the, the preponderance of human um, history and, and civilization has been compatible with bio-based processes. Thank you.